good evening, everybody, and I hope you're enjoying your dinner. Um, my name is Michaela Taufer, and I'm professor at the University of Tennessee in Oxfield. Can you hear me? Okay, excellent. Um, and I am also the SC19 general chair, and so if you are wondering what you are finding on your table, is the pin of the conference, and if you turn around, it's written as C19. This is the logo of the conference, and I am asking you to help me to advertise the conference by wearing it. And if people ask you, what is that? You can say, oh, this is the logo of C19, which will take place this year in Denver, in November. And if by any chance you want still to submit work that are deadline that are still open, student posters, uh, doctoral showcases, a lot of opportunity for uh, you to join us in November. So I'm looking forward to seeing you there. But my talk is not about SC19. My talk is about uh, scientific application and heterogeneous uh, architecture from the data analytic point of view. And as usual, when you move on with your career and you give talks, uh, you have uh, the fortune to work with fantastic people that help you uh, to put together uh, interesting and exciting research results. And so uh, these are the people that have been uh, joining me in putting together what I'm showing you tonight. And so I want to thank them. Um, and uh, as usual, we are working in teams, all of us, and uh, we all we are so lucky to work with uh, collaborators that, like us, share excitement for research. These are my collaborators. So let's go back to science and research. And I want to start by speaking about uh, trends. And a fourth trend that we see if we look around in HPC is uh, what is going on with uh, uh, the computers, the supercomputers we are using, and how we are using them. So if we look from the point of view of the I.O., so the writing and reading from storage, from disk, we see that there is a widening gap between the computing power of our supercomputers in terms of uh, petaflops or exaflops and the I.O. bandwidth or the speed to move the data to storage. And this gap is becoming larger and larger. So in this picture here on your uh, left, you see that as we move from Jaguar to Titan to Summit, this gap is becoming larger and larger, which means that our computing power become more and cheaper and cheaper, easier to reach, become almost a commodity. But this computing power on our supercomputers is generating more and more data that have to face a major bottleneck, the writing and reading to disk. If we look at the type of application we are using with our supercomputers, yes, we still look at a big job that uses all the nodes. Sometimes we do that. But more and more, we look at what we call ensembles of jobs. And so here on your right, you have a picture that sort of characterized what defined a simulation uh, on three machines that are at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And you see that as we move in the years from 2005 up to uh, 2018, when a user submit a simulation, he or she submit an ensemble of jobs that become larger and larger in terms of jobs. So these are two important trends that are together combined with what is going on when we speak about workflows. And so when we speak about workflows, we look at no longer a single application running on a supercomputer, but we look at the very complex process or combination of steps that include not only compute, but also data. And so here you have an example of uh, uh, the uh, LIGO uh, project. Uh, you may have heard about last year, uh, they, no, two years ago, in 2017, uh, the, uh, the scientists behind this project were recognized with uh, um, major recognition like the Nobel Prize. And, but this not, it's again a community, so this is work that Eva Dilma did 
as part of this community and is about defining these complex workflows that integrate computing and data analytics. Last but not least, there is an additional challenge that we are observing, which is the integration of the edge. So the computing is no longer done exclusively in terms of simulations, but there is this computing at the edge in which we use sensor or different type of tools to observe what is around us, and then we move this information to the computing resources, to the supercomputers. But as we move this information, we need to reduce sometimes the data. We need to analyze the data. So this is an example in which we look at digital twins, in which you have turbines that have sensors, and then you have a, a digital twin in terms of simulation of the turbine. And as you see, the things are not just a simulation, but you have to integrate data from the sensor and back, you can go back to the turbine and control it based on the result of the simulation. So this is an exciting uh, time full of challenges. And uh, it's, we have to um, sort of adapt and transform the way in which we do science and integrate data analytics in these scenarios. So in the rest of my talk, I want to speak about two uh, use cases that are some aspect of how to uh, adapt and transform uh, simulation to become data analytic friendly. The first use case is based on molecular dynamics. And um, I will tell you a little bit more about what molecular dynamic is very, in a very short summary. And I will address with you two challenges for this kind of uh, application. One is about data transformations, and the other one is data flow modeling. The second example is about computing at the edge, and we look at uh, an application that refers to uh, precision farming. And in that case, we look at aspect of data prediction. So different flavor of data analytics in the context of HPC and edge computing. So let's start with the first one, which is about molecular dynamic simulations. And um, how many of you have ever worked on a molecular dynamic simulation? Some of you, they are fantastic applications. They allow us really to explore several aspects of uh, uh, our system, our supercomputers, and at the same time, they allow scientists to explore fantastic uh, aspect of drug design, um, diseases that reveal themselves through uh, aspect of folding and so on. So the molecular dynamic, the classical molecular dynamic simulation is an example of ensemble simulation because you don't just run a job, and then at the end of which you see the result. Result of a molecular dynamic simulation is the statistical analysis of many, many jobs that run concurrently. So once upon a time, they used to call this simulation embarrassingly parallel. I love the word ensemble. It's more elegant, and it gives also more dignity to this important type of simulation. So the exciting part of the molecular dynamic simulation is not that you just run them and you go home and you go on vacation, you come back and everything has been done and you find somewhere on your data, uh, in your storage, all the results. It's that as you move forwards in your simulation, sometimes jobs don't go anywhere and so you want to kill them because they are using resources. Or other jobs are moving forwards and revealing something that could be potentially and statistically relevant. And so you want to fork them, but you need to know that you want to fork and explore different settings. So a molecular dynamic simulation has hundreds of thousands of jobs, and each job itself is an iterative process of steps. And so the job is, uh, normally characterized by a certain number of step. And that means that at each step, what you do is you compute the forces of each atom with the other atoms. And then from these forces, you compute the acceleration of the atoms, the velocity from the acceleration, 
and then from the velocity you compute the next position at the next step of your atoms and you go back and you repeat. So there is this iterative process and every certain number of steps, we call them stride, we need to give in output to the scientists some sort of information, otherwise what is the useful uh, application of MD if we don't know what is going on inside the simulation. And so when you look at your molecular dynamic simulation from the point of view of the simulation itself, you have this iterative process, you run steps, and uh, you have an MD code, in this case I have Gromex, but it could be charm, it could be amber, any code. And what we need to do is to build somehow a loop that allow us to explore what is going inside this black box that we don't want to stop. We don't want to stop the simulation. And so to do that, what we do is we uh, leverage the fact that molecular dynamic simulation have quite a traditional standard output. And so we plug in Plumed, which is a software that doesn't require us to rewrite the code, but just capture the output of the molecular dynamic. And we move this information not on the file system that will, it's our um, bottleneck, but we keep that into an in-memory staging area. And we are using data spaces as a package that allow us that. And from there, we plug in analytics, the data analytics that is done on the individual um, output of the molecular dynamic. And this analytics is where we can sort of unleash our creativity because it's where we can reinvent some sort, the use of linear algebra, libraries, machine learning, and so on. The final goal is that as we are generating these outputs, we learn from them and then we control back our simulation and that is where the challenge is because we don't want any longer to save on the parallel file system and then go on vacation, come back, move the file somehow, perhaps on a hard drive to our laptop and start looking at the data. But we want that as we generate this data, as the simulation evolves, we want that the analytic is there taking place at the same time. So, this is the past, this is what we want to do, this is our future, and how do we do that? We need to augment uh, the node or the nodes on which we are working, and we can do that in what we call in situ or strictly in situ. That means that the simulation is using specific nodes and we share this node also with the analytic, or we can do that in transit, it means that we have dedicated nodes that are very close to the compute node, and they are dedicated to the simulation, uh, to the analytic itself. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have fantastic colleagues who are already developing packages dealing with this kind of middlewares for uh, this scope. Uh, we are using data spaces, uh, which is supported by NSF and is developed by Trotgers. Uh, other tools are available. So what does it mean that we are doing an analytics while we are simulating a molecular system? It means that as we are moving forward and we do these iterative steps at uh, regular intervals, what we call the stride, we put in output a frame. That means the atoms of the molecular structure that are captured in three-dimensional space. And so this is an example, a very simple example of a sequence of frames that have a frequency of five in terms of strides, five steps. And so as I am analyzing them, in theory, I would like to have this global view of all of them, but that is something we cannot afford. Not in this case, but if you have a large molecule, a large protein. So what you want to do is to analyze each frame in isolation, capture somehow what is the structure of that frame, and transform that into a reduced representation of the data. So then this uh, representation can be used for a global knowledge. So we don't want to stop the simulation. We don't want to put all the frame together and compare them. A single frame is my point of analysis where I extract 
knowledge. And how I extract the knowledge is where we can apply creativity. So this is the loop. We uh, agree on that. We want to focus on how to extract the knowledge, how to represent information, capture them in single frames that are easier to handle and are meaningful for our study. So let's go more in detail and look at a specific application. Let's look at uh, protein that are in this conformation. So this you have eight proteins uh, that belong to eight families. And what we know is that the structure, we call them the secondary structure of proteins, define their functionality. And so when we develop synthetic new proteins, which happens, engineering of proteins, we want to uh, sort of create new proteins that have similar functionality to the one that already exists. But at the same time, uh, we can have modification. And so in this context, you have data set of uh, uh, protein structure like this one, hundreds of thousands, and you need to identify the structure, the secondary structure or substructure that define the protein function. Are you following me still? Okay. So if you look at them, our brain, we are very smart visually, can recognize, oh, this is an alpha helix, this is a strand, but that is something that we don't want you to spend the night in front of a computer to look at hundreds of thousands of pictures. And to make things even more challenging is that proteins representation don't come with a single uh, form. This is the same protein with different representation. So all these representations are computer unfriendly. You can make alignment, but it's quite tedious and quite demanding, and it's NPR to find effective algorithm. So what we are proposing is to change the way in which we look at protein and stop looking at them like atoms in three-dimensional space, but transform them in piece of art, which are images like this one. And we transform them in a smart way so that the image capture information about the structure of the protein. Now, I have very limited time, so I go very quickly through this, but if you have the curiosity of learning more about this, every slide has oh, the citation of the paper where you can read more. This representation goes through a couple of steps that include analyzing the secondary structures, so I mean alpha helix, beta strands, and the distances between the secondary structure, we transform them into a uh, channel, three uh, channels to be specific, and then we make a final encoding into a fixed size representation. And so what you have there is a combination of patterns that represent the type of secondary structures and the distance between the secondary structure into an image. And why do we do that? Well, we don't want to work with this. We want to work with this, and we want to leverage convolutional neural networks that are fantastic in finding patterns in images. And so you go to bed, you sleep one night, and you let your code running and do the work for you. And the work that the code does is recognizing given new proteins, what family they belong to based on their structure by using a convolutional neural network. Now, on the right, you have a summary of some of the results in this paper that look at how to, uh, it's, it has uh, a big data set of almost 63,000 molecular st protein structure, and it classified them into eight classes, eight family, and based on our approach. So you see that the average accuracy of our classification, it's over 80%. So quite interesting how we transform the representation of a, a traditional representation of a protein that is easy to recognize by our eyes but not by the computer into something that leverage machine learning and is easy to identify by the computer. Now, if I go back to 
So this is another example of how we can apply the same approach in not apply to family of proteins, but to a protein that is evolving in its trajectory and is changing its configuration. And so what you see is a big protein that have a mapping into a larger image, but then we can zoom in in specific structure and relation between them. And so you see that as they move in the simulation, at the same time, we can also look at uh, how the picture evolves and how the pattern of this transformation evolves. Now, this is something that can then inject injected into a convolutional neural network and allow us to identify patterns in trajectory. If you have hundreds of thousands of trajectory, hundreds of thousands of jobs, we can identify this pattern across our simulation because it's something we want to keep track of without us spending hours in front of a computer and use visualization. So the question you can have is what is the cost of this transformation? Or is there a bottleneck when I transform my data and analyze them? And the answer is that yes, we can have potentially bottlenecks. And when is it that we have a concern? We have a concern when my molecular dynamic simulation generate very frequently frames and my analytics is too expensive or it's not efficient and there are uh, some uh, reason for which it's not able to keep up and so in that case, what I face is either to slow down my simulation or what I have to do is throwing away some of the output of my simulation itself. So here you have an example in which we have a single node in which we run our job. And this is based on data spaces. We are using the node for the simulation and the analytic. And we are looking at the scenario in which the analytic, and so the first row on your right is the simulation, in which you have simulation, write data, simulation, write data, and so on. The second row is about the analytic. It says, read the information, analyze them. Read the information, analyze them. And you see here that the analysis in this case is a little bit too slow. It's not able to keep up. And so in this scenario, rather than slowing down the supercomputer, I throw away the information. And so the question is, can I throw away this information? And what are the consequences for scientists? So we move from the previous representation to an easier representation of proteins, which is in terms of distance matrices. So we have that we build distance matrices for uh, the uh, atom, the distance of atom in a molecule, and then we compute eigenvalues from these matrices. And the reason why we do this is because there has been work done by my group that show the, how eigenvalues or larger eigenvalues of these distance matrices indeed capture is a metadata for the structure itself. And at the same time, because we work with matrices, it creates a condition in which we can sort of explore um, the cost of using the resources. And in what sense? So you have a uh, snapshot. This is a two alpha helix. Um, and you uh, can, from that, look at the uh, distances between the atom of the first helix from the second one. And in this case, you will, what we say, a large matrix. And this can be um, a bipartite matrix. But on the other hand, you can also build um, many, many matrices that look at distances between a smaller group of atoms. So in this case, the extreme is actually the distance between segments of two atoms with other two atoms. And so you can range from one single large matrix to many, many smaller matrices all give you some information in terms of eigenvalues that are then proxy for the structure itself, the correlation between atom and the structure of the atoms. So it becomes a sort of benchmark of analytics because you have this variation 
in which you can run your uh, loop and look at aspect of what happens if I am analyzing a molecular structure and I'm just looking at um, relation of two set of atoms with other two set of atoms. So many, many small matrices or one fewer larger matrices. There are two different scenarios that have different implications in terms of memory usage, computing, if we compute from them the uh, largest eigenvalue. And so with that in mind, what we want to understand is what, how can I predict how many frames am I losing or how many frames can I indeed um, analyze if I have a bottleneck, if I have that uh, uh, I'm producing too many matrices and my analytics is not able to analyze them and generate eigenvalues uh, at the same speed as they are generated. And we did that by modeling. So we took different type of molecular system. We ran uh, different experiments in which we were looking at uh, the frequency in which the matrices are generated. It is on your uh, y-axis and the matrix size. And what we were measuring in this observation was the fra fraction of um, frames that we were indeed analyzing. Not the one that we were generating, but the one that we are indeed analyzing. That well, means that we have lost some. And so we did a very simple modeling in which uh, we use a polynomial model of degree two uh, with quite a good R square. And we apply that. Uh, this is another example of, uh, that show the process with errors. And we apply that to uh, frameworks that we generate. Uh, so we gener run molecular dynamic simulation, we generate the frames, and then we put ourselves in a condition in which we are generating too many frames and we are not able to catch up with analytics. And we observe that there is some sort of cycle. And this cycle is character characterized by the fact that there is a period of K and K plus one in which we generate frames that can be analyzed. And that this K and K plus one shift down, in this case, you see that it's sort of shifting in the direction. Uh, as I decrease the frequency in which I generate my uh, matrices. So stride is proxy for uh, frequency. The smaller the stride, the more I can generate matrices. And at the same time, I also gain in a uh, number of frames that I can indeed analyze. So there is this sort of uh, trade-off in which as I generate more matrices and analyze them more frequently, I lose some of them or more of them. And as I increase the period in which I generate the matrices, I have the possibility to analyze more of them. And what is the implication when I run uh, molecular dynamic simulation? This is an example of three helix, very simple example in which I am looking at uh, the largest eigenvalues between the first and the second helix, and you see nothing really happened. The first and the third, and something, there is a peak there that tells me that something is going on with the structure, and the second and the third, again, another peak. The peak is associated to the fact that these three helix are sort of vibrating, and then suddenly helix three make a major change, turn around like that, and go back to be still in parallel to the other one and two. And so the largest eigenvalues is telling me that there is this major change in the structure. Where is the problem? The problem is that if I don't have, if I'm not able to sustain the frequency of these matrices with my analytics, I may lose important information to the point in which I can lose even the peak that was revealed. And by losing the peak, then I don't recognize any longer the uh, change in the structure that can be relevant to the scientist. So uh, this is an example of how we can predict what happens if our analytics is not able to keep up 
Now, the question you may have is, how did you solve this problem? That is an open question we are looking at and say, can I use different type of resources? Can I move my simulation to a dedicated node in, a, in transit? Or do I really need to have that kind of frequency? Or can I really throw away uh, frames? And so these are all questions that become more simulation specific, molecular dynamic simulation specific. But, uh, it's also important to understand that as we are sort of revealing this important approach of in situ in transit, we need to keep in mind that the analytic itself has a cost and have to keep up with the simulation. So I want to move now to the second use case, and it's a sort of different world, different scientist, because it's about precision farming. Uh, there are still aspects that are common with the forced use case, which is the aspect of creating workflows that integrate analytics. It extends from simulation and analytic to simulation, analytics, and the edge, or computing at the edge. And it's about uh, precision farming. And there is one aspect of precision farming that is very relevant and we don't think some time about, which is soil moisture. So while we are sitting here, there are satellites in the sky, and some of them are collecting information about the soil moisture uh, of the planet. Uh, and why are they important? Because uh, knowing about the trend of soil moisture, unfortunately, our uh, soil is becoming drier and drier, can have impact at the level of food production, wildfire propagation, and so on. Now, these satellites are taking the information by uh, using, uh, collecting uh, raster data. And the uh, issue with this data is that um, they are not complete. So as you see, this is a snapshot of one pass of our planet by a satellite, and you start seeing that there are a lot of gaps. And the gaps are caused for multiple reasons. So for example, over the Amazon, the satellite is not able to do a good job because of the dense vegetation, or over the Arctic and Antarctic, there are uh, challenges there because of uh, snow and ice cover. So we have a lot of gaps in this information. The other problem we have is that satellite, as they take this information, they take the mean of the soil moisture for a very large uh, piece of the land, which is normally 27 kilometers per 27. Now, if you are a farmer, or if you want to study the trend of uh, uh, states and production in agriculture of states, a 27 by 27 kilometer, it's quite a coarse grain information that is quite useless. So what we need is to support uh, the scientists in two directions. First of all, we need to fill the gaps. And second, we need to move from a coarse grain to a fine grain representation of the data. Fine grain to the point that we want to go to the kilometer by kilometer, rather than 27 kilometers per 27 kilometer. And here is where we, as a scientist, computer scientists, can help because it's where we can build a workflow that uh, support uh, uh, this problem. And so you start from the edge where you collect data, and you collect data from the satellite, but we have also a combination of other information, like, for example, uh, the landscape surface, topography information, or uh, like, for example, aspect of uh, uh, climate, temperature, and so on. And where we plug in is that this information, we need to extract and manipulate the information to move from a coarse grain to a fine grain uh, representation of the information. And why do we do that? Well, I told you it's important for uh, precision farming, for food production. One aspect that uh, I'm working with calling on is whether uh, this component of uh, information, the soil moisture, can be um, an important driven factor in wildfire and wildfire simulations. Uh, you may be surprised uh, 
may be a surprise to you, but several simulation codes for uh, wildfires don't integrate explicitly soil moisture. And so that is an open question for some of this code. And of course, the idea is that then, if I can simulate wildfire with the integration of soil moisture, then I can send back information to the community. I can change the way in which I collect the data. Uh, here is where uh, we can not rely exclusively on supercomputers because the supercomputer is here, the sensor are here, and something in between have to connect them. And uh, what we do is uh, using the cloud uh, as, as a tool for uh, preliminary analysis and prediction of uh, um, this uh, fine grain information. So this is our loop. We go from sensor to prediction, uh, from coarse grain to fine grain information, and then we would like to inject that into uh, simulation that uh, emulate wildfire propagation. So um, the rest of my talk that I think I'm almost at the end, I don't know how much I have, probably two seconds and a half. Uh, I want just to cover another aspect that um, it's related to the analytics, and it is about uh, representation and prediction of data. Um, it is about how do I get from this coarse grain information of soil moisture to a fine grain? And we look at that and we say, okay, well, the easier way that we can do that could be by using KNN. It's quite popular, correct? So um, that has a sort of local approach in which you look at the average value of uh, points that are neighbor to my unknown soil moisture value, and you build based on that values, the value that you're missing. The other aspect is to use something that is more global, which is orthogonally, rather than looking at local information and finding some sort of average, I look at the entire space and try to build some sort of uh, uh, equations or surface that uh, has a, a polynomial degree, and that is referring to what we call surrogate-based modeling. None of these two methods is perfect. So let's say that you have this kind of points, very simple example. And this is the type of method you want to build, the model you want to build. So you don't have some values, but you interpolate the points. Now, if you use a surrogate-based modeling that try to build a polynomial degree n, one single, with a single degree, and you pass across all the points, like in this case, you see that you are uh, in some cases very accurate and in some very far away from what is your uh, observation. Now, let's see what would be if I have a uh, two uh, nearest neighbor model, two NN, and that is based on two points. So you see again, you are failing in representing the model. So none of them is ideal. They are sort of orthogonal, local focus, KNN, or global interpolation, the surrogate-based modeling. So what if we take the best of both? And so that is what, uh, with my group, we were looking at and say, well, if we take the best of both, we want the local information, but then we want to construct, construct polynomial representation that are not necessarily uh, degree zero or one, what you would get from KNN. And so that is what we call the hybrid modeling HIPPO, which is hybrid piecewise polynomial modeling that build a collage of uh, uh, polynomials, representation of the space based on the local data. And so um, let me show you an example of what HIPPO can do. So this is a set of observation, it's a 2D space in which we are measuring performance in this case. It doesn't have anything to do with the soil moisture yet. I keep that for the end. So this is your representation. You have two parameters that are changing and based on their parameters, uh, you have a specific type of runtime. This is how you would get if you apply a surrogate-based modeling the best. You capture the peak, but then when you have all this cliff, the surrogate-based modeling try to smooth things, and so you miss the dramatic changes that you may have. Uh, this is what you get with uh, KNN, 
uh, in which you lose information on the peak because you're missing local information on the edge. And, <coughs> and this is what you get with the EPO in which you have a combination of both. And so you build this collage of polynomial <coughs> solution. And so it's quite promising. So what we did is based on this observation in a completely different field, which is performance analytic, we took this method and apply it to soil moisture informations. And so um, what you have here on the left is the result of a coarse a fine grain representation. I should have put also the coarse grain. The coarse grain is a sort of points that you see depicted. <coughs> And, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, so you have the representation of hippo, and on the right, you see uh, a fact that show you the type of degree of the polynomial you are building. <coughs> so my cough is telling me that it's time to end. <coughs> I want just to complete by saying couple of words about what we have seen, which was a lot, and I went from molecular system to soil moisture to prediction of performance. So we saw that there are two major trends in the HPC community. One is about the converge of simulation and analytic. The other one is the emergence of uh, um, edge computing. <clears throat> I told you about example use cases in which we try to build workflow that uh, are closed loop workflow in which we run the simulation, we analyze the data at the same time, and we inject the information. Or we collect information at the edge, we define some analytic of this information, we apply them for simulation, and we send back to the edge. Um, now, said that, it was an ex a set of examples that show how sometimes the creativity in the representation, in capturing the information in the data can become an opportunity for um, exploring new direction. Uh, that is definitely not the solution of the uh, problems we have with data analytics. Uh, there are several challenges, and each of them uh, can become an opportunity for uh, research. Uh, we need to work at the level of efficiency. Uh, we saw a couple, an example in which uh, when we are not efficient in analyzing, we lose information. We need to be non-invasive, that is that we cannot stop one of these steps in our workflow, and we cannot uh, sort of interrupt processes uh, because we are not able to capture the information as they, the, the simulation or the analytic evolve. We need to be general. So we build workflows, and um, they have uh, aspects that are application-driven, but still we need to be able to reuse component. Uh, portability across system. Uh, Summit is already old, almost, I think. We, we are speaking about a new platform. That will be a challenge. Uh, so are our solution portable across uh, multiple platforms that are transforming? And scalability, we need to scale to large problems. So these are my challenges. I think that each of them can become interesting opportunity for collaboration. What are your challenges? That, that is something we can discuss after my talk. Thank you.